Es geht gleich in Kürze weiter mit diesem Mann hier. Hier haben wir schon mal seine zwei Bücher raufgestellt. Tomislav Perko nämlich. Und ähm, dieser Mann hat sich gedacht, ich probiere einfach mal die Welt zu bereisen. Und zwar fast ohne Geld. Das hat er gemacht, indem er gehitchhiked ist, gecouchsurft hat, irgendwo freiwillig angeheuert hat und sagt, hier bin ich, kann ich was helfen, kann ich hier irgendwie übernachten? Und er äh, ist gesegelt über den Ozean und hat diese ganzen interessanten Reisen schon vielen, vielen Leuten erzählt. Über 300 Talks auf der ganzen Welt hat er gehalten, sehr inspirierend. Und oftmals auch befreiend für viele, die sagen, oh, ich dachte, ich habe mich nie getraut zu reisen, soweit, weil ich auch nicht die Kohle hatte. Aber ähm, vielleicht für den einen oder anderen Inspiration. Ja, wie gesagt, er hat hier zwei Bücher und das ist seine letzte Runde, wenn man so will, denn er hat schon so viele Vorträge gehalten, aber beim Berlin Travel Festival für euch hat er sich gedacht, da komme ich auf jeden Fall nochmal vorbei und wir freuen uns sehr, dass er heute hier ist und uns von seinen Reisen erzählen wird. Er kommt eigentlich aus Zagreb, da ist er zu Hause und bald wird er da seine eigene Bar aufmachen. Da können wir ja später nochmal drüber quatschen. Aber jetzt freuen wir uns erstmal auf How to Travel the World with Almost No Money. Hey, 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 hey. Hey guys, I'm Tom from Croatia. And in the last couple of years, the world has been my home. I travel. I hitchhike. Cars, trucks, horses, motorcycles, boats. I drove in buses, trains, rickshaws. I worked all jobs. I spent time with locals. I volunteered. I became a monk. I'm just kidding. I sailed across the Indian Ocean. I tried things that I never tried before. I've seen things that I will remember as long as I live. And all that with almost no money. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Berlin Travel Festival. Uh, my name is Tom, or which is short for Tomislav, and I come from Croatia, as you heard is th in this nice announcement. Uh, today I will be talking about how to travel the world with almost no money. But at the beginning I have to tell you this won't be uh, just a ordinary uh, travel lecture where I will be talking about the places I visited and what have I done there. Uh, I will try in the next half an hour, 45 minutes, uh, tell you what's been going on on this, uh, my travels around the world and uh, the lessons I've learned. And also I will try to answer some of the most common questions usually people ask me. Um, there will be some time at the end for uh, Q&A, so if you will have any questions, uh, write them down or something and then we can talk afterwards. I also brought some of my books with me, just a couple of them, so later we can talk about that as well. Uh, my story starts uh, around 10 years ago, actually exactly 10 years ago, when I lived a pretty different lifestyle. Uh, I was a stockbroker. Uh, this is not my photo, this is some other guy, uh, but we pretty much had the same lifestyle. Uh, I was working in a stockbroker office and uh, I was one of the most successful young stockbrokers in Croatia earning a lot of money, going out to nice places, dressing nicely, not like this today. And uh, I, I had a pretty nice lifestyle. And uh, then 2009 came, 2008 actually, uh, the financial crash. Um, and in just a matter of weeks, I lost pretty much everything I've got. I lost uh, my job, I lost all the life savings. I was even in a huge debt. I was in debt for around 30,000 euros. So it wasn't really a nice, period of my life, I was 24 years old, um, and then with a uh, few accidents in my life, uh, my life changed when I started thinking about traveling as a thing that I want to do next. Um, why I came up to that idea, I have no, I, I don't know, but uh, it probably has a lot to do with discovery of this website, so you probably all heard about it, it's called Couchsurfing. Um, if you don't know what couchsurfing is, it's a network that allows you to host people in your own homes or to stay at other people's couches when you're traveling, uh, when you're traveling abroad. Um, and I went crazy about couchsurfing and in uh, one or two years I hosted more than 150 people from all around the world. Uh, and just talking with them and seeing this spark in their eyes, I made a decision that I want to travel. Um, I also knew that, I, that there is no chance for me to travel because I was broke. 
But then these people came up to me and uh, they educated me about how to travel the world with almost no money. They told me about these alternative ways of traveling and they showed me that it's not only it's possible to travel with almost no money, but it's for them even cheaper to travel than to live in their own city. So I was like, seriously, show me the way, right? Uh, and they told me about uh, all of the things that I will use in the, in the future. Um, first thing, uh, first step was the critical one. Uh, a lot of times people ask me what's the most difficult thing on your journeys and I always tell them to make that first step. Because I was afraid, uh, I had no money, I had nobody uh, else to go with me on my, on my first travels. Um, but after you do that first step, everything else is pretty easy. My first travel was uh, actually to Amsterdam. Uh, back in the days I was a huge uh, Dinamo Zagreb supporter, I was watching football still. And uh, Dinamo was playing against Ajax in Amsterdam. And me and a couple of my friends were like, yeah, let's go to Amsterdam. We've never been to Amsterdam. And, you know, we'll go there and see museums and stuff, what you do usually in Amsterdam. But unfortunately, all of my friends canceled in the last minute. Some of them had uh, no money. Some of them had to study for their exam. One of them, like his girlfriend, didn't allow him to go. So uh, I, was, I was left by myself in front of a decision. Should I go by myself or should I stay at home? And I went by myself, it was the, my first couch surfing that I, that I did abroad and it was one of the best things that I could do. Because I've realized that it's, it's not that big of a deal to travel by yourself. You just have to make that first step and everything else falls into plan. Uh, so, uh, you, I told you that uh, I was uh, learning about these alternative ways of traveling. A few, a few things were the most important to me, apart from couch surfing. So couch surfing was one way that I could handle my accommodation costs and cut them to, to really minimum. Uh, but also I was uh, hitchhiking as well. Uh, after the uh, first couple of travels around Croatia, Balkan and, uh, and Europe, I embarked on my uh, biggest trip ever, uh, which was my round the world trip called Thousand Days of Summer. Uh, because it lasted 1,000 days and I wanted to travel uh, all around the world where, where it's summer. So I got the, uh, the idea for the title from that movie. Maybe you saw it 500 days of summer, but I was like 500 days is not that much, so let's do it double, right? Uh, so you can see my route. I started from Croatia towards east. I went through Asia, Australia, Indian Ocean, Africa, and ended up in, in South America. Uh, now I will tell you a couple of uh, stories from this round the world trip. Uh, one of them is uh, concerning uh, hitchhiking in Iran. Uh, I love to tell this story because, it, first of all, it's a funny story. Um, and you have to know that uh, hitchhiking, apart from couch surfing, was my main thing to do on my round the world trip and all of my other trips as well. Because I, had, I didn't have to pay for uh, accommodation or I, I didn't have to pay for transportation. Uh, but in some countries, hitchhiking is not as easy as it usually is. I've hitchhiked a lot uh, in Germany, and it's pretty easy, you know, in the, uh, on the highways and stuff, on the Tankstelle, how you call it. Fahren Sie nach Berlin. I remember saying that sentence quite a few times. Uh, actually, Berlin, this has nothing to do with this presentation, but Berlin was actually one of the biggest... Uh, fault for me that I went on this trip because when I started traveling around Europe I actually came to Berlin that was back in 2009 uh, because I met this girl who was couch serving with me and I came to Berlin to like be with her and then she kind of like dumped me so I continued traveling so if it, if I wasn't dumped in Berlin I would probably never travel around the world so thank you Berlin thank you very much uh, so yeah back to hitchhiking in Iran uh, in Iran, you cannot really hitchhike like you normally do in Europe because this in Iran means this, right? So you didn't, I didn't really want to go around uh, Iran and like, hey, hello guys who were passing by. So I found the guy who wrote this sign uh, for Tehran. Uh, I mean, I, I hoped it was signed for Tehran. I had no idea, was it? Uh, but it turned out that it was and I was staying on this roundabout waiting for cars to stop. And after a couple of seconds, like one guy came up to me and he's like, Tehran. I was like, yeah. He's like, come with me. I was like, 
this is some sort of world record, you know, like in just a couple of seconds I found the ride and I grabbed my backpack and went after this guy and he brought me to a bus station. He was like, bus, Tehran, goodbye. I was like, seriously, man? Uh, so I was like, yo, thank you very much, but I'll go back and try to hitchhike, you know, I don't really have money to go to 1,000 kilometer distant Tehran. So I went back to the spot and I continue hitchhiking and another guy stopped and he's like, uh, Tehran. I was like, yeah, come with me. I was like, bus station? No bus, no bus. And I was coming after him and we came to a taxi station. He was like, taxi, Tehran, goodbye. I was like, come on, man, seriously, this is even more expensive than, than the bus. So I went back and the third guy was actually the best. His English was really good. And he came up to me and he said, I'm not sure where you are from, but you don't have to hold the signs like this. We have the signs over there, you know, so we know where Tehran is. I was like, seriously? So I just took my backpack and went to the bus station and just took the bus to Tehran. And I realized it wasn't really that expensive because the petrol costs in Iran were really, really cheap. Uh, so it took me like maybe for 1,000 kilometers around 10 or 15 euros, so that was a pretty good bargain. Um, another, thing is when, another thing when it comes to hitchhiking, a lot of people ask me uh, how safe it is to hitchhike, right? Like how many times have you been murdered and stuff like that, so I always tell them not, not as much. Uh, but, and I always try to tell this story when I, when I was starting this round the world trip and starting from Croatia, going towards East, everybody in Croatia was really warning me, you know, like, Tom, be careful. You know, you're going to hitchhike, you're going to sleep in some random places, you know, like, you've been traveling around Europe and Croatia, that's okay. Croatians are cool people, you know, of course. But as soon as you cross the border, go into Serbia, you know what Serbians are like, right? You know, very dangerous people, somebody might kill you. I was like, okay, thanks for the warning. And when I went to Serbia, it was amazing, you know, everybody was just welcoming me, hosting me in their homes, taking me with their cars, going out with them, drinking and so on. And I was driving towards Bulgaria and uh, I was driving with one truck driver and I was telling him how Croatians were warning me about Serbians and he told me, like, brother, you know, like, don't be silly, you know, like, Croatians and Serbians, we are, we are brothers, you know, don't, nobody will touch you in Serbia. But Bulgarians, oh my God, now you're going to Bulgaria, well, as soon as you cross the border, be very careful, somebody might kill you. And the same story happened over and over again. You know, Bulgarians were warning me about Turkish people, Turkish people about Kurdish people, Kurdish people about Iranis, Iranis about Pakistanis, Pakistanis about Indians. Indians didn't warn me about anybody, it's like the last frontier or something, like they warned me about other Indians. Or they told me like, if you survived Pakistan and came to India, you will be okay, don't worry about it. So, uh, kind of a point behind this story for me, it was don't believe in other stories people tell you, especially these horror stories that you hear from all around the world, either from the media or most of the time from the people that never travel themselves. You know, like a couple of weeks ago I met this girl and uh, we were talking, she knew that I was uh, like a traveler and stuff and she asked me, uh, where's your favorite, uh, favorite place in the world, what's your favorite country? And I don't like to answer that question, but I told her like it's India. India is my favorite country. And her reply was, yeah, India, but it's, for me, it's too dirty, you know, I, I don't want to go. And I'm like, where have you been in India? And she's like, I, I was never in India. But how do you know it's dirty? So uh, those are the things that kind of stick to our minds. All these things that we hear from, a, from somebody else that probably has never, has never been there. Uh, on the topic of India, this was my first day in India. I uh, went from uh, Iran to Pakistan and crossed the border to India. Uh, this was my first train ride. I didn't really hitchhike that much in India uh, because I saw their roads. I was like, there's no way that I'm going to hitchhike here. And the drivers were, were really crazy. Uh, so I just took the trains, which were really cheap. And trains in India have uh, lives of, of their own. Uh, you have like many classes, you have the first class, second class, third class, sleeper class and this one, this one I like to call a no class wagon because there's no class inside. You just, you just come up in, inside and hope that everything will be okay. Uh, many times you don't even have to have a ticket, uh, there is no reservation because 
everything is just crowded, you know, like you have to fight your way to get inside the wagon, you know, like people are throwing away babies and stuff like that. So I, I managed to, to walk in there and uh, of course I, I wasn't able to, to sit anywhere because there were people uh, sitting down everywhere and lying down on the floor and you can even see the guy lying uh, up, up there where you usually keep the luggage. So I was like, yeah, cool. So I was just going to stand like this for the next seven hours until I reach my next my next stop, and that was that was okay. And I was in a new country. I I was turning around. I was watching uh, things, how people um, how people react, and trying to understand what India is all about just by riding in their train. Uh, that was pretty intense, I have to admit. One specific thing uh, got attached to my mind is it, it was middle of the night, maybe in the middle of the trip. And I was standing like this, I, I literally couldn't move. You know, there were like kids over there and like I couldn't even move my leg. I was like, I was stuck there in the, in the middle of the night. I just felt something dripping on my, on my left foot. And I realized there was this, this little baby uh, that had no diapers and he was peeing on his mom. And from his mom, it was going down on my leg. Uh, and then I was like, the first reaction I had was like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, nobody ever peed on me unintentionally. So I was like, oh my God, what should I do? Uh, and my first reaction, I was like, it was kind of out of body experience. I, I, I was looking myself and my own reaction. The first reaction was panic, you know, do something about it, throw like, move your leg, uh, do something. And the, the second reaction was like, you can't really do anything, right? You should. You can just stand there and like let it pee all over you, uh, but it will be okay. You know, you, you are in India and like nothing will be. You know, like in a couple of days you will find some water and clean it pro probably. So uh, I was just uh, you know breathe in, breathe out, and told to myself, oh, "Welcome to India." You know, this was this was a warm welcome, uh, definitely. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, that was my first day in India. Everything after that was really going upwards, as you can uh, as you and you, as you can imagine. Um, so yeah, let's uh, see. Uh, yeah, uh, apart from hitchhiking and uh, couch surfing, I did some volunteering as well. I did the volunteering uh, because of different reasons. First reason was sometimes because I was just too tired to travel. Uh, I, was I was traveling intensively and uh, sometimes after two months of traveling, I really wanted to settle down somewhere to like, you know, to slow down. Uh, so, I, so I volunteered. Volunteering was the best option because I could give something to the local environment and then it's also very cheap. So most of the time uh, you are working a couple of hours a day in exchange for food and accommodation. And you can learn the local language, you can get to know the local culture, and so on and so on. So uh, volunteering was was amazing, uh, amazing experience. Sometimes I just come up to a place and uh, meet up with people and ask them, like, do you need some help with something? Or you can use uh, internet. Uh, I don't know, Woofing or Help Exchange. There are a couple of websites that real or Workaway. Workaway was my favorite, actually, uh, website. Uh, so you can work your way uh, around around the world. It, that doesn't really cost you that much. Um, sometimes I even worked uh, for cash, right, to get some money. My daily budget, uh, I didn't mention that at the beginning, but my daily budget when I was traveling, it was really low. It was between 5 and 10 euros a, a day, and that was including everything from transportation, accommodation, visas, food, and so on. But even uh, with that low budget, I, I still needed money. You know, I, like I wasn't traveling completely, completely broke. And when I came to Australia, I was like, I can earn a lot of money uh, by working here. The problem was that I had no uh, working visa, being Croatian and all. Uh, we didn't really have a working uh, work and travel program. And now we do for New Zealand, but that's another story. Uh, so yeah, I was, uh, I was just walking around Australia or traveling around Australia looking for work. And after one month of staying in Australia, I was, I was picked up by a guy close to Brisbane. And uh, after a couple of minutes, we became best friends, you know, he was, uh, he was driving me maybe 10 kilometers. And I told him I was looking for a job and he's like, what do you do? I was like, oh, whatever it needs to be done. 
And uh, he's like, yeah, you come with me, you will work for me. I had no idea was he like, what, what's he doing, you know? He could have been a drug dealer or something, but uh, he wasn't, unfortunately. No, so he, he was just uh, painting this hotel in the middle of Brisbane. Uh, and he invited me to like hold a letter for him or uh, uh, be a traffic diverter. Uh, that was my favorite job. Uh, I was just telling people, please don't go this way, go this way. Uh, so a very, very hard job, as you can see. But I was, I was getting paid $20 an hour, which was uh, pretty good for somebody who's traveling with five to $10 a day. Uh, and I calculated it took me only 13 days to earn enough money uh, for all of the expenses I had from Croatia to Australia. So it took me eight months to get from Croatia to Australia. And all the money I spent, I earned in only 13 days of telling people, please don't go this way, go this way. So it was a pretty good, pretty good bargain. I had a couple of other jobs uh, in Australia, and that was the that was the way how I earned my money to uh, for those small things that I had to pay during my round the world trip. Uh, one other thing uh, I would like to mention is uh, dumpster diving. Uh, maybe you heard about it. Most of the people think it's uh, it's a bit too extreme for them when they when they travel. Actually, the first time I tried dumpster diving was in Berlin. The the idea b behind Dumpster diving is that uh, no food goes, goes to waste. So there's a lot of times where, uh, I don't know, supermarkets close down for the day and they throw away a lot of food that is not going to be sold tomorrow. So some people just go to these bins and take the food that it's still good to eat. That's what I did when I was in Australia as well. Uh, with a couple of my friends, we just went to supermarkets after the closing hours. We took the food that we found in the bins, we disinfect it when we come home, of course, uh, and you are good to eat. Like this was just 15 minutes uh, in one dumpster diving uh, episode and it took us like, we, we had enough food for the next seven days. Uh, and it also, also brings me down to uh, one question of uh, cost of traveling. Uh, a lot of people, when I, uh, when I tell them where I've been, how I traveled, a lot of them ask me, uh, was the cheapest country to travel in. And I always tell them, like, guys, I have no idea because for me, my budget was the same in India and in Australia. And they're like, how is that possible? You know, Australia is 10 times more expensive than India. And then I explained them, well, it is, but the style of my travel changed when I came from India to Australia, for example. Let me give you a few examples. When you are in India, I told you I wasn't really hitchhiking a lot because there were huge distances between the cities, uh, the trains were really, really cheap, and uh, the roads were not really safe, and they don't have that in their culture. Hitchhiking, like if they see you standing beside the road doing this, they will have no idea what you're doing, right? So um, I didn't hitchhike in India. I spent a little bit of money on the trains, but even that little money of trains, it was more than I spent on uh, transportation in Australia. Because in Australia, everything was so darn expensive that I, uh, that I had to hitchhike wherever, wherever I went. Same thing with the accommodation. In uh, India, couch surfing is not that good, you know, and you can't really sleep on the streets uh, in India. I mean, you can, but I didn't want to. Uh, I like my life and stuff. Uh, so uh, I paid a couple of euros a day for, uh, for some cheap hostels or hotels. Uh, and in Australia, everything was so expensive that I had to couch surf or sleep uh, in my tent or sleep on the road uh, and stuff like that. Same thing goes with, uh, with restaurants. In Australia, in four months of being in Australia, I never went to a restaurant uh, because everything was so expensive. So I had to like uh, do dumpster diving or uh, go to uh, some supermarkets and cook the food for myself. And when it comes to India, I didn't do dumpster diving in India, trust me. Uh, like if you do, uh, there are probably some people that are hungrier than you are, so you don't want to do that. Um, and uh, it's really cheap to eat in a restaurant in India, like for like one or two euros, you can get, you can get the entire meal. Uh, so my point behind this story is it doesn't really matter where you travel, uh, it matters more how you travel. So uh, yeah, uh, Australia can be as cheap as India, so that, that, that will be my answer to that, one of the most common questions people ask me. Um, one other thing uh, I like to point out during my, uh, during my lectures and my stories that nothing is really impossible. You know, when I started this trip, everybody was 
telling me like you won't be able to do that they will kill you in that country you will be uh, sick in India you won't be able to survive whatever and this was the thing that I had no idea it was possible uh, it's boat hitchhiking so when I found myself in Australia I was like where should I go you know I have to take the flight you know it's expensive flights but I also learned about about boat boat hitchhiking and uh, there are a couple of websites for the people that travel around the world with boats on their like mini yachts and I found this American guy he was traveling from Bali to Africa and I was like hey man you know you are you looking for somebody else to join you on this trip I can I can help you you know I'm I'm from Croatia we have sea and islands you know and like he was like oh very good very good and I, I uh, he was actually looking for some somebody with experience and my experience was based on that that I was from Croatia you know like even though I was born in Zagreb has nothing to do with the with the coast and my biggest adventure on the on the sea was like going from one place to one island with a ferry you know that was my sailing experience right uh, but I was counting on this, like this guy cannot really, uh, like, uh, he, he cannot really know that, right? How can he check, am I a very good sailor or not, right? So I met up with him on, on Christmas Island, which is still part of Australia, and we went together to, uh, to Africa. So that was, that was probably the biggest adventure of all. Uh, probably it was the biggest challenge as well, uh, because it lasted for uh, 45 days, so a month and a half of sailing. We stopped only, only twice. First stop we had was on uh, Cocos Islands, and second one was uh, Mauritius. Uh, Cocos Islands is uh, actually uh, a beautiful place. It's also uh, an answer to one of the other most common questions people ask me. What's your favorite place in the world? What's your, the most beautiful place you visited? And so on. And I always tell them this place because it really really is beautiful you know but what i want to point out uh, when i when i talk about the most beautiful places is it doesn't really matter you know because the beauty of the place is just one aspect of the of the loveliness of a certain place that you visit how you love a certain place and how you feel about a certain place it, it doesn't really have to do a lot with the beauty of its place it has to do with the people you meet there it has to do with the uh, culture you experience there, the food that you eat there, uh, what was the weather like, uh, were you sick or not, were you in love maybe in that place or not. So uh, there are many different things that define the beauty of a certain place. So uh, when you think about your next destination or where you want to travel, don't think about only the beauty, beauty of, a certain, of a certain place. Uh, this was my uh, bed when I was uh, one night in, uh, in Mozambique. And Mozambique is, uh, is a huge country uh, between, uh, I don't know, South Africa and then uh, Tanzania and Malawi and so on. And when I was uh, traveling uh, through Mozambique, uh, I, had to, I had to stay in places like this because I couldn't really find any hotels or couch surfings were really, really rare. And most of the couch surfers were just Americans or some expats that were uh, working there. So. Uh, I came to this place, it was, uh, it was nighttime, it was raining, and um, I wanted to sleep, so I, uh, so I found, this, uh, found this truck, and I was like just w wanted to go underneath it, because it was raining, of course. But there was a lot of people on the streets, right? I, I really did, didn't feel comfortable. It was pitch black. I was, uh, I was the only white guy, so I was like kind of glowing in the dark, you know, uh, walking down the streets of this city. And a lot of them were like drinking beer and uh, I, was, I was afraid, of course. And uh, when I found this place, right next to it, there was a police station. So I was like, this is good, you know, probably nobody will touch me if there is a police officer standing next by. So I went to the guard in front of the police station and I couldn't speak Portuguese or their local dialect, whatever. So I just come up to him and like, hello. And he was like, he was scared of me at first. Like, where did you come from? And I told him like, I'm going to sleep there because it's raining. You please check that these people don't kill me, right? So he was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, so, I, so I managed to spend the night there and um, tomorrow I moved, moved forward. But this story, I also tell it because a lot of people, when they hear my story, they, they, they look up to me and they say, Tom, you are such a brave guy. You know, like, I admire you. I could never do what you did. 
And then I, I was thinking about, am I really brave? Is this some courage that I was born with? Was this the reason that I traveled around the world like this? And then I realized that people think Tom is a brave guy and that's why he travels. But when I thought about it, I realized it was the opposite. I traveled first and then I kind of became brave or something. I'm not sure brave is the right word for that. Because a lot of people think being brave is something that you are born with. But for me, being brave is not not being afraid, you know, like you're, you're going towards something and you, you couldn't care less about it and then you're brave, right? For me, courage is the, the, the point in time where you are really, really afraid of something, but at the end you still do it. That's courage for me. So during my travels, I was afraid pretty much every day, you know, like you, you encounter some weird places, some weird people, many, many times you drive with some people that shouldn't be, re shouldn't really be allowed to have driver's license and stuff like that. Uh, but this was uh, my point of, of saying this is, uh, don't be afraid of the fact that you are afraid of things, right? Because many times where you just go through your fears and just do the things that you think they're impossible to do, then at the end you realize it wasn't that big of a problem. Um, and one of the last stories, maybe the last story I will tell you today, is the story of my favorite moment of my travels. Uh, was when after uh, more than half of my trip, uh, my father came to visit me when I was uh, when I was in Kenya. Uh, um, the long st story goes something like this: when I was uh, when I was a kid, whenever we were uh, watching like those documentaries about safaris and Maasai people, my father would be like, "Oh, one day I would like to go on a safari," you know, and everybody was laughing at him because. He spoke only Croatian, he had no money, he, he flew only once in his life from Zagreb to Split and that was pretty much it. But when I came to Africa, I realized this story, uh, I, I remember this story and I called up my dad on Skype and I told him like, Dad, like now it's your chance. If you want to come to Africa, I will wait for you, I will be your guide, I will, I will even pay for your plane ticket to get here. I earned some money in Australia and so on. And my dad was like, sure. Son, wait for me there. So one day he got, he just came to uh, came to Kenya. Uh, my dad is here on the left side. Uh, so it's uh, it was a really cool uh, it was a really cool uh, moment. Uh, three weeks we spent together. We went hitchhiked once. He had no idea that we we're going to hitchhike because I told him let's wait for the bus. And while we wait for the bus, you just hitchhike. I'll take a couple of photos of you and we'll send it to mom. So she thinks we hitchhike. Ha ha ha. And he was actually, yeah, sure, no problem. And while he was hitchhiking, it took me like 10 minutes to take the photo. And eventually car stopped. And my dad was like, no, 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 no hitchhiking. No hitchhiking. But eventually we went into the car because I told him there were no buses in, in Africa. So yeah, he was like, okay. Uh, so this was a very important uh, thing for me because we bonded in those three weeks more than we bonded in uh, like my, my entire lifetime. But the, the story I would like to point out here is a, a different story. My father unfortunately passed away around two and a half years ago. And uh, I love to tell this story uh, because of the lack of time that we people are not really sure uh, we have. Um, and I want to tell you a little story about deadlines as well. Because people are, we, we are weird creatures, you know, when we have deadlines, when we have the exam on our university or something, or we have to do something uh, at our work, when we know the deadline is approaching, we like run out like, oh, I have to do it now. And then eventually we do it, right? Before the deadline. But the thing with the most important things in life is that we don't really have deadlines for the most important things, you know? And then people always keep postponing those things. You know, traveling, I will travel, you know, eventually. Like I don't have a deadline for traveling, right? I mean, there's only one deadline in life when you are dead, but nobody knows when that's going to happen, right? So when, you, when you're talking about traveling, when you're talking about, I don't know, building a new career, starting a new, uh, new job or a new company or going out to that girl or that guy, you always like, I have time, you know, when the conditions are perfect. I will travel when I, when I get more money. I will travel when, when my friends will go with me. But try not to do that because uh, with, this, uh, with this, I always remember that uh, deadlines in life uh, tend to surprise you. Fortunately, my dad uh, said yes when I offered him to come to Africa, so he kind of beat that deadline until the rest of his life. He was talking about this experience 
with me in Kenya. So try to try to set your own deadlines when you don't have them, and uh, like yeah, don't po postpone things in your life. Uh, pretty much the last slide today. What have I learned? Uh, I could talk about this uh, a lot. I've been talking about like 40 minutes already, and I haven't even reached this subject. So I've learned a lot. I even like wrote two books about what have I learned and what have I done on my on my on my travels around Europe and around the world. And uh, I've learned many things. Uh, the, probably one of the most important things was uh, to be grateful. Uh, to be grateful for for a lot of things. Like when I'm now back home, I'm really grateful that I have a bed. Uh, where I can sleep every night, that I have uh, food that I can eat every night, that I have, uh, I can go to the doctor when I'm sick. Those are those were the things that I didn't really have all the time when I when I was traveling. Um, uh, you you ha you have to be grateful for for the earth as well uh, because you see uh, you see a lot of pollution and you see what uh, people have done to the mother earth. You know when you're mother nature when you when you travel, so you kind of get close to it, you get more attached to it. Uh, I've learned that uh, you shouldn't really trust other people's horror stories, especially I told you the story about hitchhiking, uh, but don't trust other people that are trying to scare you and tell you like, oh, don't go there because this and this will happen or don't go and uh, don't do something and so on and so on. So I've learned uh, really a lot of things, uh, but the most important ones I, I've been through already in my in my presentation, and at the end I would just to uh, would just to repeat uh, that uh, don't wait for the perfect moment. You know, don't postpone things. Uh, and I'm not even talking about traveling, guys. Today I am holding a travel lecture because I've I've been traveling a lot in the last 10 years or so. But traveling is not the best thing in the world. It's not the most important thing in the world. You know, like if it is for you, great. Then go out and do it. But if you want to do something else, focus on that and do that. Because traveling can be everything. Traveling can be uh, raising a child or uh, having a family or starting a new business or finishing an education or whatever you want it to be. But the most important thing is when you do something, when you want to do something, just do absolutely everything in your power to get there. Because if I was thinking about things that will go bad on my travels, I would probably never start it. But if I knew, like, I had no idea that I will be one day talking in front of a bunch of people on Berlin Travel Festival or, uh, or doing things that I'm doing right now in my life. So yeah, like that, I would like to uh, uh, point out that also uh, try to forget everything that you've been listening to me today and all the other uh, lectures that you've been here. Because I always try to remember that this was my story. It doesn't have to be that you will have the same story. It doesn't have to be that you will enjoy hitchhiking and couch surfing like I did. It doesn't have to be that you will enjoy traveling in a way that I did, that you will enjoy it as well. Just try to remember this fact that pretty much everything is possible. And if you really do everything in your power. So forget everything that you hear, but create your own story. You know, find something that you are really passionate in your life and just pursue it. Because like that famous quote says, 20 years from now on, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did do. Thank you very much, guys. Tomislav, that was very impressive. Thanks a lot. Dankeschön, Dankeschön. Sehr gerne. Ja, so genau. you've traveled the world without any money, but... A little bit of money. Of course, there are um, some books. Maybe someone wants to buy them. I only brought like five of each. Uh, so I will be just here in front. If somebody wants to buy it. Uh, it's like 15 euros each. So if you want, like I'll be able to drink afterwards. So if not, I'll be, I'll be sober. Or <laughs> yeah, and if you do like this, it's not like that, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah don't do Thanks don't a do lot. That, yeah. Nice. So you are opening up your own bar in Zagreb. Yeah. Uh, when I was traveling, I really fell in love with um, cocktails and juices and stuff like that because I was volunteering a lot, a lot of times in bars. So in the last one year, I was working a lot in some uh, street festivals in Zagreb. 
So I figured out that this is something that I really want to do. And after the book, after the so many talks I've given, I've raised uh, some little bit of money. And um, yeah, in three weeks, I'm opening my own juice and cocktail bar in in the capital. So we'll see how that goes. It's kind of traveling as well, but this time I won't be traveling, but other people will travel to me, and uh, like it's pretty much the same thing. So and you can mix cocktails as well. Are you a good cocktail mixer? Yeah, I mean I'm not the best, but uh, depends what you have, you know. Like okay. if you have couple of ingredients I'll do something for you so. <laughs> very nice thanks a lot you stick around a little bit like outside with your book I'll just be at this table for the next 10 minutes uh, so if somebody wants to ask me a question unfortunately we don't have that yeah, much we're time. Out of time we have some other interesting uh, interesting lectures ahead so yeah I'll be in front Tomislav Perko this is your applause thank at you the very Berlin much. Travel Festival thank you